Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our upper room service uh, this evening. And uh, we get to celebrate the death, anticipate not only his burial, but his resurrection. We set aside these times this day, working toward Resurrection Sunday. Can I hear an amen for Resurrection Sunday? I mean, that's right around the corner. But many of us have been preparing for this night as well as the next three days. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you that uh, fasted and prayed. And we, we're actually praying for compassion, compassion for the lost. And so we, we come together. We had a meal. We got to break our fast with the upper room, the Wednesday night family meal. It was really good tonight. It was really good. Um, I met a brand new family uh, tonight. And um, just to post you guys a little bit, it's the largest family night meal we've ever had. And so just to um, let you know, um, God's still doing something new with new people. And all of us that aren't so new, he's still doing something new. And you say, well, what's this service all about? Well, we're going to put Proverbs on hold. And we're going to focus in on the upper room. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to take communion. We're going to remember what happened in the upper room. Now, we don't have a time. We don't have time. There's five chapters in the Gospel of John with the upper room. We're going to look at the fifth chapter, chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, be sure to get your Bible. We're going to cover this whole chapter I'm going to try not to preach too much. I'm going to try just to read, explain some of what the Lord is praying for us, what Jesus prayed. You say, well, how come you're doing that on Thursday or on Wednesday? Well, there's two theories when Jesus died. Some put it at Good Friday, resurrected on Sunday. Others put it at Thursday, resurrected on Sunday. I like the math better when you say Thursday. He was three days and three nights, and he was raised. So I'm not going to argue about that. I'm not trying to prove a point, but you're, you're sitting on a Wednesday when I believe the upper room actually happened on a Wednesday. And so those teachings by Jesus to his disciples, I mean, they're irreplaceable. These, these five chapters in John are irreplaceable. You'll remember it started with Jesus washing their feet. You remember as it continued that Judas was excused. That'd be a nice way of saying it. And then with the 11, I mean, Jesus went into the depths about his joy about his crucifixion, about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then finally, after this upper room discourse, four chapters. Look at the very end of chapter 16, the very end of chapter 16. This is the end of, you might say, the official sermon, if you want to call that, this teaching by Jesus. Verse 33, Jesus said, These things I've spoken to you that in me, in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Father, I thank you that your son in that room gave hope to disciples that were hopeless. Gave comfort to them, Lord, hours before he went to the cross. Promised the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. And then, Lord, that we can have his peace. Even in the midst of tribulation and trials. And I know, Lord, in this room, pretty much all of us, we have some kind of trial, some kind of tribulation, something's going wrong. For some, Lord, it's like cratering. But I thank you, Lord. These words were spoken the night before their worst nightmare could ever happen. I mean, they're just hours from the cross, and Jesus still offered them his peace. 
I pray, Lord, as we spend a few minutes in chapter 17, as we partake of your table, the very body and the blood of Jesus, that we'll remember, Lord, we'll remember that we celebrate this night. We anticipate Sunday. We thank you so much for resurrection. But help us, Lord, not to miss the prayer of all prayers in our Bible. Help us to pay attention to the words of Jesus as he spoke to you when this upper room was finished. Bless us, Lord. Bless us with the Holy Spirit. Give us insight. Help us to make application and to enjoy communion as we remember the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. That only he would receive the glory. He's the only one that's worthy. And all of God's people would say, Amen. You know, that's where you have to put this chapter in perspective. It's right before the cross. It's at the end of the upper room. I actually believe that Jesus prayed over these disciples. He prayed to his father. And when you talk about the prayers of the Bible, the number one prayer in the entire Bible is John chapter 17 unmistakable this is the prayer matter of fact a lot of people if you only had one chapter this would be the one chapter many many theologians and pastors would pick so i just i want to minister it to you i want it to be the words of jesus to you more than like here's my sermon about this the prayer i want us to hear the prayer from jesus okay this is the prayer that jesus prays and the bottom line, what he's praying is that the world might know him. I mean, the key to evangelism, the key to our witness is in this prayer. So when Jesus here ending the discourse with the disciples, he now prays with them. I believe this is still in the upper room. Chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus here, he prays for himself. He's actually praying for himself at the beginning. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. Notice his posture. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, Abba, the hour has come. It's the hour. We've seen in the Gospels over and over, my hour hasn't come. It's not my time. The hour hasn't come. Well, now it's come. It is the greatest hour, the greatest point in history of the universe. You see, God is about to sacrifice his son. The God that loves this world, the God that loves you so much, the hour has come for salvation, for redemption, for the body, for the blood of my son. It's the hour. It's the time of all times. And we celebrate that tonight. Jesus prays for himself. He prays for the hour. Father, the hour has come. Glorify. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. Oh, it's not just the hour. It's the glory. You say, what glory? The glory of all things coming together. The glory of why God did all of this. The glory of what Jesus is about to do. The glory includes not only the death and the burial, but the glory includes the resurrection. Glorify your son. Can I see the, the quote by a Trench? Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son. That is, make plain to these here and here, make plain to these here that the man Jesus is also the God man. Make it plain by his resurrection and ascension. Can I hear an amen? amen? And these disciples really got the message as they watched the next series of events, especially the resurrection, and then especially the ascension after that. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give Notice it's a gift, eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me to do. And now, 
Oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself and with the glory which I had with you before the world was. As Jesus prays for himself to his Father, it's the hour, it's the glory, the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son. Can I see Spurgeon? Notice he prayed for God to receive the glory. When, when you, Grace Church, when you ask a blessing from God, when you ask a prayer, when you ask a blessing from God, ask it that you may glorify God by it. Amen. Do not pine to have your health back again. Be sure that you want to spend it, your health, for him. Do not desire temporal advancement. No, desire that you may promote his glory. Do you even long for growth in grace? Ask it only that you may glorify him. Amen. That one thought is worth you coming here tonight. That one thought that Jesus just modeled for us might make you pray different. So I'm not saying don't, you know, you get to pray the same prayers, but make sure your motivation is to glorify him and not yourself. That's the way Jesus prayed. After he prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples very specifically. I have manifested your name to men, to the men whom you have given me out of the world. Now, he's already covered that in the first paragraph there, but, but now he's actually focused on the gift, the way Jesus prays about the gift. And you say, what gift? The men that God the Father gave him. I've manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. They've kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. The gift that God the Father gave to God the Son. The very disciples were a gift from God the Father to God the Son. We always talk about receiving the free gift of salvation, and amen that we should. If you have not received the free gift, eternal life of salvation, you need to receive that gift. It is the gift of God. But did you know you are a gift to the Son from God the Father? Let me say that again. You are a special gift from God the Father to God the Son for his glory. Amen. Can I hear you say amen? amen? And you say, little old me, little old you. <laughs> we're chosen, we're picked by God the Father to give to his Son. And yet you still said yes to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? You're a beautiful gift. By the way, God the Father loves you. And he gave a love gift to his son. And by the way, his son loves you. The whole thing is motivated by love. And sure enough, love captivates our heart. Amen? Amen. That's actually worth coming to church to remind yourself. Because maybe it's, you know, other people around you, they don't think nothing special. God thought you so special for his son, he picked you and gave, him to, or gave you to him as a gift. You have given them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I am glorified. I am glorified 
and the people at Grace Church that know me. Verse 11, not only does he pray for the disciples in the gift, but verse 11, now I am no longer in the world, but these, the disciples, are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Holy Father, notice he doesn't call it just Father, now it's Holy Father. Keep through your name, keep through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. Can I hear you say the word kept? Yes. By the way, there's security in this prayer. There's the gift, and then there's the security. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. Well, except the son of perdition, that would be Judas, that the scriptures might be fulfilled concerning Judas. Did you know that when you're a gift from the father to the son, and when the son praises the father for you being a gift, did you know God the father and God the son keeps you? <clears throat> let, me, let me rephrase that. You are in the security of God the Father's name. Amen. You are in the security of God the Father's character, who he is. It's not like just saying his name. It's who he is in your name, in your name. You kept them. You'll keep them. We are secure. So what are you worried about? Let me see if I'm a gift and I'm secure. That's like a guarantee. Oh yeah, and with the Holy Spirit sealing you till the day of promise. Guzik says it like this. Jesus did not pray, keep them through an angel. He didn't pray that. Or keep them through Pastor Bill. I'm glad he didn't pray that. I can't keep myself, let alone keep you. Or keep them through their own effort. The work of keeping a believer is so significant that it takes the name of God the whole character and authority of God. Now, before you try running off from Jesus, just remember, he's going to come hunt you down. It's just easier to stay with him. Just stay with him. Why go to the woodshed unnecessarily? Because he does discipline those whom he loves. And he loves you. So you try to run away, he'll find you. He'll find you. Well, now you guys are here on Wednesday night up a room, so you're found. Amen? In case you've been wandering lately or recently, just come back and say, Lord, forgive me. I need that perfect fellowship again. And the name, the character of the Lord. It's part of his prayer. It's part of his prayer. The gift, the security. Oh, don't miss the joy. Verse 13, but now I come to you. I come to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Some of you need a lot of this point right now. <laughs> that your joy might be full. Not joy that you produce, not joy that the world produces. Joy that I mean, the joy of Jesus is what he's praying for. Remember, he's praying this prayer hours before the cross. It's just the night before. He's saying, Lord, <clears throat> I know that they're secure, but I want them to have my joy. I want them to have my joy. Guzik on that same point, or on that point, Guzik says, if Jesus was so concerned for joy amongst his disciples that he prayed for it, 
we can know that he is also concerned that we, Grace Church, Wednesday night, have joy. God's purpose is to multiply joy in our lives, not to subtract it. The world, the flesh, and the devil would tell us something different, but God wants joy fulfilled in our lives. We'll say, Pastor Bill, I'm just not feeling it. In comparison to what? Because if you're counting on your circumstances, if you're counting on how your day goes or what the rest of this week looks like, my joy can't ride on that. It can't. My joy has to ride on what Jesus has already done, what Jesus has already accomplished, what Jesus means today, what my main job today is to do, which is not my personal happiness. We're not talking about your happiness. We're talking about joy. We're headed for heaven. Can I hear an amen? Amen. That's proven by the resurrection. You already have resurrection power in you. You should already have the resurrected life working in you. You shouldn't be the same sorry thing you were before. I'm preaching now. We're talking the joy to get through Thursday. You say, I plan on having the best Thursday ever. Well, you'll probably be disappointed when you get to whatever it is tomorrow and Friday. By Saturday, you'll be depressed because you didn't get what you wanted. And Jesus comes along and says, I want you to have my joy and my peace. I already took care of it. You're secure in my name. And he prayed for it. Because he knows it's not an automatic. It's not. And I'm preaching more to me than I am to you. I woke up this, this morning. I was so dry. I was just so dry. I thought, Lord, I don't, I don't know how I can pull it off. I can't pull it off. I can't fake joy. I can't fake peace. I can't. Lord, if you don't come and help me. And he did. I won the lottery. I don't know if I told you I won the lottery. <laughs> he didn't win the lottery. What happened? God knows how to answer that prayer. Amen. Amen. Even though I can't explain what happened. I do know there's something when you get with God's people. Amen. You pray with God's people. And I could start to feel it, just start to feel it. And I'm just confessing to you, I didn't feel it in my devotions this morning. I just didn't. I wish I did every time, but I don't. Not every time. But by the time I hit prayer time here at this church at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays, that's when part of our staff prays, I could feel it. Then when I sat down and worked through the the stuff of John 17, by the time I was done between the word, the Holy Spirit, God's people, and just God's grace, just God's grace. Then I get to, you know, eat some potatoes. Oh, boy, the potatoes were great. (laughs) with God's people and meet new people and and get to have communion with you. I'm good. I'm good. The joy of the Lord is true. But he prays for it. The security, the joy. Don't forget the word. Verse 14, I've given them your word. I've given them your word. The world's hated them because they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen for the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. Just amen, amen. Amen for Grace Church. That's what we run around. That's what we read. That's what we study. That's what we preach. The word, the word, the word. Not for information, but transformation. The word focused on Jesus. The word with the Holy Spirit. The word, the word, the word the word like we are right now and then sanctification not just the word but it says sanctify set them apart make them holy by your truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world I also sent them into the world 
And for their sakes, I sanctify, I set apart myself, that they also may be sanctified, set apart, made holy by truth. His prayer for the disciples, the gift, the security, the joy, the word, the sanctification. And by the way, sanctification does happen after salvation. It does. That's a gift from God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. That overlaps to us, obviously, as we're now disciples of the Lord. But I'm so impressed that Jesus went to the third dynamic there. That would be a prayer for all believers. He actually looked into the future, you know, at you and I. And Jesus prays for all believers. Jesus prayed for you. Now, this paragraph is very complicated with good stuff. And so I'm just going to summarize it with one point. Jesus prayed for you and for us that we, with the rest of believers, might have unity and love. Jesus prayed that we might have unity and love. There's a reason why he prayed that. And by the way, we do have unity and love. You might not have unity and love, but we do. You might not be conforming to it, but Jesus already made that true. Notice what he says. Verse 20, I do not pray for these alone the 11 disciples. I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you. You believe in Jesus because of the gospels. You believe in Jesus because of the epistles. You believe in Jesus specifically because of the apostle Paul. You believe in him because of their words. Amen? The ones that would believe me, believe in me through their word that they all, all of the believers, all of them may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. Here's the reason. That the world may believe that you sent me. We are already one. We just don't act like it all the time very well like church to church, believer to believer, sometimes in the same church building. But we are one. We are one in Christ. You can't be a Christian without being one in Christ. And by the way, the other ones in Christ with you look different, act different, speak different, age. I mean, they're all different. But the unity is already there. You just have to recognize it. He says that the world may, may believe that you sent me. Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect, that would be mature, that they might be made mature, perfect in one, and that the world, that the world may know, that the world may know that you have sent me. And have loved them as you have loved me. Unity and love is what he prayed for. Why? That the world will believe. That the world may know. You say, how's that going to happen? When we do our job right, right right inside Grace Church, like tonight, and probably somebody in this room, probably somebody in this building walked in. They're still in the world. They haven't come to Christ. They haven't been to church on a Wednesday night. Maybe they've never been to church. And they walk in here and they see a bunch of weirdos loving each other <laughs> and serving each other. And then, then, you know, whoever that is, I don't know who it might be, but they're like, hey, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're not even the same color. They're all different colors. They're not even the same age. They're all different ages. They, they don't look like they all come from the same background, like a bunch of doctors sitting in a room. There might be a couple doctors, but probably not many. And like, I think there's some rednecks in the room. And I, I think there's some 
bikers in the room. I think there's some farmers in the room. For sure there's some cowboys in the room. And the biggest weirdo of all of them in the room is me. That's really true. And I love it. I love having a church full of weirdos. And you say, I actually had a guy tell me one time, he said, you can't tell your church that. I can, because it's true. <laughs> it's actually true. So I'm not knocking you, I'm just telling you the truth. To be in a group like this means you're weird. You're different, you're unique. But you see, you can't explain that. Because we don't agree. We, we, don't, we agree about one thing, Jesus. We, we don't agree about anything else. Well, we agree about the Bible. We're still learning that. We, we agree that we're going to follow the Lord. That's true. But if you think we all agree, politically, we don't. Socially, we don't. Environmentally, we don't. What do you agree about? Jesus. How's that look? We love him and we love one another. Now, don't hear me throwing things away. I have convictions in a lot of those areas. But that's secondary to the unity and the love of the body of Christ. What God has called us to do. What has God called us to do? That the world may know that the world may know that the world will believe because when they walk in here and they see all of us so different and so unique and so, but they, they still love each other. Why do they love each other like that? Because we're all one in Christ. I'm actually complimenting you. I don't know if you figured this out, but I can't find another church like this one. I just can't. I love it. I love it. I love it. And you say, how'd that happen? Just preaching this, a lot of fasting, 40 four years in Amarillo, and this is what you get. Praise God. Now, when I say that, please don't misunderstand. We are not the best church in Amarillo. I'm not saying we're not the only church. I'm not saying that. We are one with all the other churches. And you say, well, they're so different than us. If they know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, we are one with them. Now, if they don't know Jesus as their Savior, well, oh, I don't know what that means. Well, they're not our brothers or sisters. But if they are, and you say, well, they're just crazy over there. That's, that, that's true. I can't fit into that one. Or they're really, you know, they're like dead over there. Well, I understand that too. But I got to go on. Okay. I think you got the point there. Um, I and them and you and me that we may be mature in one and that the world may know, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may be that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, notice at the end of this prayer. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name. And will declare it that the love, the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God the Father in you. God the Son in you. God the Holy Spirit in you. God's love in you. God's love in you. Why else would you come on a Wednesday night? God's love in you, and he will sanctify you. He's already declared you holy, and he loves you. He heals you with his love. That's how God does it. He doesn't scold you to his son. He attracts you to his son with love. And the more we can understand the unity and the love that God prayed for us, that Jesus prayed for us, the better not only we will be, but the more of a witness we will be for all those people we've been praying for. Can I see the quote by Wearsby? One of the things that impresses the world, it impresses the world, is the way Christians love each other and live together in harmony. It is this witness that our Lord wants in the world, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me the lost 
the lost world cannot see God, but they can see Christians. And what they see in us is what they will believe about God. What they see in us is what your neighbor will believe about God. If they see love and unity, they will believe that God is love. If they see hatred and division, know any churches like that? If they see hatred and division, they will reject the message of the gospel. Grace Church, I've been your pastor for 38, going on 39 years. God is good. And we are blessed with one another and communion. Father, thank you for Thank you for preserving the prayer of your son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for breathing on John to make sure he got all of it correct. Thank you for preserving your word, Lord, down through the centuries to where tonight we already got to hear the words of Jesus. The greatest prayer that's ever been prayed, recorded, right here. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you prayed for us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that motivates and gives us that kind of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Thank you for the unity in our church family. Thank you that that's manifested even as we sit down and have a meal together with strangers. You could feel it upstairs. And now as we are about to partake of the, the Lord's table, I pray that same unity, Lord, the same love would be manifested at Grace Church. We anticipate Sunday and many, many guests in the house. I pray that the unity of grace and the love of grace would be a witness by itself. That the message that we preach, the gospel, would be received by all. Thank you for this table. I pray that we do it in a manner that is worthy and holy. To Jesus. Bless us, Lord. It's in the name of our Lord Jesus we would ask. Amen. As we pass out these elements, please hold on to them until everyone's been served. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after supper and said this cup is the new covenant the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Could I ask you to stand with me as we pray before we partake together? Father, thank you for this this upper room night. We do take the time, Lord, to remember what happened just 24 hours before the cross, 72 hours before the resurrection. that besides your word written down and besides 
listening to the words of Jesus, we get to see this beautiful picture to remember Jesus. That this bread, Lord, it reminds us, it represents the very body of Jesus, the God that became man, the God-man that could die, a body that was given for me and my friends. We thank you for the word incarnate. We thank you for the word that died. Lord, we remember with this bread how we thank you for the blood of Jesus, this new covenant, Lord, that is in this little cup, the reminder of it, that it's not our efforts, it's not our work, it's not how well we keep the Bible, it's all by grace. It's by the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins. And that, Lord, you bled out for us so that we might freely, with forgiveness, Lord, come and partake together and be refreshed, even right now, by Jesus. So do your work. Bless us, Lord, as we partake. We do this for your glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All of God's people would say, Amen. enjoy your Lord. He's good. Matter of fact, let me say it this way. He's the best. Now wait, we just looked at the Lord's Prayer, right? Is that right? Wow, somehow I got done at 10 after. That's kind of a miracle. Or maybe it was planned that now we're going to pray. We just looked at the Lord's Prayer. We're going to pray. We're going to take our time. You're going to break up into three or four of the people around you. Here's what we're going to pray for, for the next seven minutes. we got seven minutes tonight. We're going to pray for unity and love. We're going to pray for compassion for the lost. We're going to pray for Christ's joy. Do I hear an amen for that? Amen. Okay, Grace Church, you know what to do. You've got six and a half minutes, I think.